Hello and welcome everybody to the 84th edition of the study of Exploding the Israel Deception with Tom Fress from Inquisition Update and Jörg from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This is the sixth edition where we go a little bit astray from the book itself because we really think that it is absolutely of a vital importance to understand who the biblical, historical and prophetic antichrist is when you want to understand exploding the Israel deception. I mean, we cannot do a reading on the Israel deception if you don't understand that the papacy is, was and always will be the antichrist. You cannot understand our reading there when you don't understand that what we teach is the same thing the reformers taught years and years and years ago. People before the reformational times, during the reformational times and after the reformational times. I don't want to do a long intro. I want to save you that. But I want to tell you that it is of utmost importance that we go through these extra parts to show you that it is the office of the papacy, the head of the Roman Catholic Church, that is the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist. You know, as always, I have a support here, Tom Fress, and he is not only my support, he is the missing link to me, I'd like to say almost, you know, we, we fill each other so well, or we complete each other so well in these broadcasts, that's what I love to do about them, that everything when I miss to say something, uh, he jumps in there and he says it. And, um, you know, last time I was speaking about the town hall of Nuremberg, um, and, uh, of course, um, Tom also probably is known with the fact, because he probably saw the same videos that I saw years and years ago, but I haven't researched that part yet. So, uh, today I had five minutes during the premiere that was just running before our recording today on the 30th of March 2022. And I thought to myself, well, let's go into that again, because I want to explain to you the figures that you saw. Now, let's go back to the figures uh, that you saw on the Nuremberg Town Hall. Um, we have here the German page of Wikipedia. Here you have the picture of the Nuremberg Town Hall. And you see a person uh, and, and, uh, and something else and another person and still, uh, and there you see a beast. So here you see, here you see a beast, that's it. Here you see a beast, here you see a man, here you see a man, and here you see a beast. Now, the explanation of that is on Wikipedia, but that is really something, quote-unquote, funny. Now, I don't think it's funny. It's betrayal. Yeah? Now, this is German, and probably not everybody of you who's watching this can read this. But the interesting, says, uh, interesting part, is, it says here, under the sculptures of the three Baroque portals, Baroque is a uh, middle-aged uh, term, uh, time there, Baroque time, at the west front of the town hall throne, uh, made 1617 by the sculpturer Leonard Kern are four antique world kingdoms. Nebuchadnezzar II, Kairos II, Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar. So as I told you last time already, these figures represent the four beasts, the four kingdoms, made known by Daniel in chapter 2 with the metal man statue and in chapter 7 with the different beasts. But they didn't show the beast, they didn't show the lion and the bear and the leopard and the uh, undescribable fourth beast, which is different than all the others as it is written in Daniel chapter 9. They chose to show Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. They sh chose to show Kairos II, a king of the Medes and the Persians. They chose to show a bust of Alexander the Great, who ruled Greece. And then, of course, Julius Caesar, who is famous for ruling pagan Rome. So this is what we see here. Yeah? We see here uh, this beast. This should be probably Nebuchadnezzar. You know, I, I cannot go into every detail here because I haven't studied this picture so far, but it says it shows these four things according to the beast. That's what the German version says. Listen closely. Now we go to the English version because, yeah, this is an English spoken video, and we want to see about what does the English Wikipedia say. And then, of course, it goes into trivia. Huh? This trivial knowledge, okay? <laughs> you do with that whatever you want. And here it says... 
among the sculptures enthroned on the three baroque portals created in 1617 by the sculptor Leonard Kern are figures depicting the prophecies in the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel. Uh, chapter of the book of Daniel in the Old Testament of the Bible, so this is uh, not a very uh, meaningful sentence here, where they stand for various world powers in history. EU, and this is an, a, a U with an, uh, two points on it, it's, it's an umlaut as we say, and this actually stands normally for Einheitsübersetzung, that is the Unitarian Translation Bible, that's what that says for. So here it just says EU and the bear on the portal to the left of the main entrance. The leopard of the four wings, uh, of the four bird wings and four heads, and the mysterious beast with ten horns on the portal to the right of the main entrance. Where is Nebuchadnezzar here? They left Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon completely out of the description. Funny part is, it says this article has multiple issues. Yeah, I'd say <laughs> this article may require cleanup. Yeah, and correction. But don't you think it is strange that they miss to mention Nebuchadnezzar or Babylon at all? It goes on with the bear. The bear stands for Medo-Persia on the portal of the left entrance. The leopard with four wings and four heads that stands for Greece. And the mysterious beast with ten horns. Of course it is mysterious because they don't tell you what it's all about. And like I told you, when you are a, a, a tour guide uh, in, in, in Nuremberg, uh, these guys don't have any idea what these figures stand for. When, when asked in interviews that I saw, and they were asked uh, what do these figures stand for, nobody could give you an answer. Really, nobody. Okay? So that's why I wanted to go into that. Now, I told you that this EU stands for a Bible translation. Yeah? They want to say, okay, this is standing in the book of Daniel in the uh, Old Testament of the Bible. So when we then go to this uh, part and open this up here, it says, search Daniel uh, 7 and version 4. Then the Bible opens up. Now look what a Bible you get when you open that up. Biblia Sacra Vulgata, a Latin Roman Catholic Bible. <laughs> that is the information that people get when they just study Wikipedia, when they just study mainstream information sources on information they seek on uh, topics like this. And they are even brought here to a Bible that is written in Latin. Who understands that? I don't. Do you, Tom? No. I'm telling you, uh, uh, the listeners ought to know by now, with all the lists of the Reformers and the people who lived prior to the Reformation, who are documented as believing that the papacy is the Antichrist of the, of the Bible, uh, now we show the evidence of the of this uh, town hall in Nuremberg uh, when at the time that it was built, they were not ashamed to depict these four beasts as described by Daniel in the Bible and the fourth and final beast being the Roman beast. OK, there won't be a fifth beast. The fourth and final beast on the earth that will see Christ's return is the Roman Empire. That means the Roman Empire never died. It just, you know, we've been told from cradle to grave that the Roman Empire was was, was destroyed, that that uh, that it was it was done away. But that is a lie. Either that or Daniel is lying. Now we know Daniel was not a liar. He was a prophet of God, and he said the fourth and final beast in the world would be Roman. And we've been proving. Uh, by scripture and by history and by every other means that the Roman Empire simply morphed into the Holy Roman Empire under the Caesars known as the popes. And this is what was believed at the time of the building of this city, of this uh, town hall in Nuremberg. It's visibly portrayed in stone. Daniel was a true prophet of God and 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 Germany at least believed exactly what Daniel prophesied. There would be four Gentile nations 
that would uh, kingdoms that would rule the world prior to Christ's return. The Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, and the fourth and final beast on the earth is Rome. There will never be a fifth Gentile empire. Okay, there's not going to be a Jewish empire, as many futurists would love us to believe. It's a Roman empire. And Rome never fell. It simply morphed into the Holy Roman Empire under the Caesars, known as the popes. So the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. That's what all the saints of God believed all the way back to the first century Christians who prayed for the longevity of the Roman Caesars at the time of Christ so that uh, they would be prolonged and their wealth and health and prosperity would be preserved so that they might delay or restrain the rise of the Antichrist. Okay, that's why they prayed for the longevity, the health, the wealth, and the prosperity of the Caesars of the old pagan Roman Empire to postpone the rise of the man of sin. Daniel told them that when this Roman emperor is taken out of the way, who is restraining or withholding the rise of the man of sin, as soon as he is taken out of the way, the man of sin will be revealed. And all of this must be before Christ returns. Well, certainly 2,000 years ago, it happened or 1800, rather. The old pagan Roman Empire under the Caesars appeared to suffer a mortal wound. It appeared for all intents and purposes as being dead. But it never died. It just, it just like, like the phoenix rising from the ashes, the same head just pointed by the popes, okay? It's a play-action fake, okay? The historians would have us all believe the Roman Empire's over, but we know it's not because we know Daniel is a true prophet of God. Daniel said the fourth and final beast upon the earth before Christ returns is Roman. That we have in the figure of the papacy. And uh, he is anti-Christ. He appears and claims to be the leader of the Christian world, the greatest moral authority, and, and as if it were Christ on or God on earth. That's what the papacy officially calls itself. That's why they call him Holy Father, okay? That's why they call him the Vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth. He is God in the world, and he rules and reigns over the kings of the earth. And here you have depicted in, in, in stone over the, 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 the lintel of this, the door to this uh, uh, establishment in Nuremberg, a visible portrayal of Daniel's prophecy. Yeah, the West Portal you, of the Town Hall. And you see here, so, sorry Tom, to interrupt you here. Yeah, I yeah. see now here you have the lion's head, that is Babylon. Here you have Kairos, the king of the Medes and the Persians. Here you have Alexander the Great, and here you have the beast of the Ten Horns. So yeah, all four go. are there. I just didn't recognize this here. This is the lion's head. And uh, this is a visible pictorial representation in stone, exactly what Daniel prophesied and exactly what happened in history. And the Protestants of Germany knew this. They knew who the Antichrist was. They knew who that fourth and final beast was. And they protested against him. They protested against the papacy and against the Roman Catholic Church. They called it the synagogue of Satan. Okay? And th this, is, uh, this is proof in stone what they believed. You don't have to take my word for it. You don't have to take Yerk's word for it. Here it is cast in stone what... The, the, the Protestant Europeans believed at the time of the Protestant Reformation. They believed the man of sin was the papacy, and he was revealed as soon as the Caesars were taken out of the way. And uh, uh, why don't we know this today? Why aren't we taught these things today? 
why are we ignorant of these things? The answer is simple. The papacy denies being the Antichrist, even though he cannot possibly deny it. There's too much evidence in support of it. And he has deceived the whole world into thinking that the Antichrist is not historical, it's future. So the man of sin, the son of perdition, cannot be revealed in the world until just before Christ returns. When in fact the Antichrist has been the base, the 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 power to be, to deal with for every king, every queen, every prince, every potentate throughout the entire Christian era. The saints of God have been persecuted by the papacy and by the kings of the earth over which he ruled for the entire church age. Daniel's prophecy, the 70th week of Daniel, was fulfilled 2,000 years ago by Messiah the Prince, and Antichrist was revealed to the world soon thereafter. It's a done deal. Now you know who the Antichrist is. Now you know who the restrainer is. Now you know who the first beast was. The first beast was the first Roman beast, the Caesars, the ones who ruled when Christ walked the streets of Jerusalem. They were the ones that oversaw his crucifixion. And they seemingly took on a mortal wound it appeared for all intents and purposes that this Roman beast was going to die. But before taps could be played on the trumpet, the papacy came to power and has ruled the Roman world ever since. He has ruled over Charlemagne, Pepin, and every king, every queen, every prince, every potentate for nearly 1,500 years, okay? He slowly grew in power. He slowly grew in jurisdiction. He slowly grew in uh, uh, influence. He slowly grew in wealth, and he used all of his assets to make war against Christ and his saints, and he's doing it yet today. And uh, you keep looking for a future Antichrist, you will be deceived. You are deceived. You will be deceived. And the object of all of this futurist nonsense is to have you worshiping a false Christ when Jesus returns. It's the whole object of it. And that false Christ is the one we've been telling you about forever. It is the papacy. And uh, I've dedicated nearly 20 years of my life to teach people this. And uh, it's true. It can't be refuted. It can't be rebutted. No one has even made a serious attempt. It's just in your face. It's so undeniable as to be laughable that anybody would even try. And uh, you have to ask yourself, what is wrong with my church? What is wrong with my pastor? What is wrong with my government? Yeah, everybody says the United States is a Protestant government. Well, I want to know where the hell the protest is. If this is a Protestant government, where is the protest? And who do we protest? If it's not the papacy, there's no need for a protest. And that's what you've been learning in your churches, that the papacy is not the Antichrist. It's a single individual that probably isn't even born yet. And you're going to be long dead and gone before he ever comes. And in the meantime, the real Antichrist rules and reigns over the kings of the earth. The people are so blinded to the historical truth, looking for this future pipe dream, they can't see they can't see the nose on their face. They can't see recent history. They can't see Protestant Reformation time history. They can't see pre-Christian era history. And we are so blind, deaf, and dumb as to be useless, useless. And I'm here to tell you, my days of uselessness are over. And I'm going to bring the truth to anybody that'll listen. And Yerk is in with this as far as he can get. 
And I, I, I think the listeners, if you can't raise a serious, uh, uh, a serious rebuttal, a serious, uh, you know, uh, controverting evidence, then you must believe the truth. And uh, I think tomorrow the pastors uh, should be preaching to empty pulpits. I think the, the priesters and the pastors of the world should be preaching to empty pews. They deserve to be abandoned. They're liars. That's the best that could be said for them. They're liars. They flat out know the truth, but yet they would never utter a word of it. And uh, they want unity with the Roman Catholic Church. They want you to come under the authority of the man of sin in Rome. That's why they've joined this ecumenical movement. That's try. That's why they try to find common ground with the Roman Catholic Church. They try to share in the in, in projects like the anti-abortion campaigns and feeding the poor and 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 charitable hospitals and and oh, it's just wonderful works they do. Well, the works they do is not going to prevent them from suffering the eternal flames of hellfire for denying Christ and uniting with Antichrist. And don't you be one of them. Don't you be one of them. You've got it in stone, in Nuremberg, Daniel's prophecy. They knew it long ago. They don't teach it in the churches anymore. They teach lies. Don't patronize them. Don't darken their doors anymore. Leave the whore that has betrayed Christ and has found another spouse in the papacy. Back to you, Yerk. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. Don't you think it's interesting to maybe lose a few words on the point that when you click on the Bible link that you are being led to a Biblica Sacra Vulgata? Well, certainly they're trying to protect the fact that the papacy is the Antichrist. They want you to hear these truths from a Roman perspective. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy is going to deny that their holy father in the pap- in the in the uh, in the, uh, in the uh, Saint Peter's Basilica is not the Antichrist. Of course, that's what they want you to believe. That's why they they've promulgated all this future idea of a future antichrist to get to exonerate the papacy and that's why when you click on a bible link you get you get the uh, the latin vulgate you're going to hear a roman catholic per- perspective on this that's what we're telling you all of it's become roman catholic even your protestant and evangelical churches have become roman catholic because they no longer denounce the papacy and they keep all the old the ancient pagan Roman traditions like Christmas, Easter, and Sunday Sabbath. Did you know that it was Constantine, the Roman emperor, the Roman Caesar, that declared that Sunday would be the new Lord's Day and that anybody observing the seventh day Sabbath was 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 uh, Judaizing? They made it illegal and they persecuted anybody who up, who, who observed a biblical Sabbath, a seventh-day Sabbath. Why doesn't your pastor tell you this? Why doesn't your pastor tell you this? He's hiding the truth from you. And what has he got to gain? If he gains the whole world, he'll lose his own soul. I count my soul worth too much to risk by taking carefully devised fables. The fact of the matter is God's law never changes, just like God never changes. And uh, what was Sabbath the day he made it is still the Sabbath today. And it's a day of rest, not a day of obligation. Everybody says, well, well, I, I worship God seven days a week. I worship God every day. Sabbath is not about worship. It never was about worship. 
oh, yes, we know Jesus on the Sabbath day went to the synagogue. It was his custom to read the, from the scriptures. Yes, indeed, he did. And that's lawful for God, a God-believing, a God-loving Christian to do, to read the scriptures on the Sabbath. Absolutely. But it's a day of rest, not a day of obligation. In the Roman world, you must go to church on, Sat on Sunday. Okay? It's a day of obligation. It's not a day of rest. You go to church and you parrot all the false lies, all the false prophecy, all the and, and practice all the false traditions of Romanism. Okay? You've got the whole world led astray. Sabbath is, was, and always will be a day of rest for man. You can worship God any day you want. It's not about worship. It never was about worship. And it was issued by God Almighty on the seventh day of creation, and it applies to all men of every stripe that was given long before there was ever a Jew. It was given long before there was ever a nation on the earth. There was a man and a woman and a whole bunch of animals and birds and fish and creeping things. Yet God issued the Sabbath. It's a day of rest for man. And God created the Sabbath for man, not man for the Sabbath. And, but, but the whole quote-unquote Christian world would have you believe that if you don't come to church on Sunday, the Lord's Day, then you're backslid, okay? Uh, you can do whatever you want to do on Sunday, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, neither you nor your wife nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. Not even the beasts of the field are allowed to pull a plow on the Sabbath day. It's a day of rest. It is observed by man, woman of every rank, and even the animals. The beasts of burden are put to bed on Sabbath. It's a day of rest. That's all it ever was intended to be, a day of rest. And yet, you can't call yourself a Christian unless you worship on the Sabbath day, right? And the Sabbath day has even changed to Sunday. Listen, people, you can't get more screwed up. You can't get more screwed up than Christians are today. And you've got nothing but your apostate, Protestant in name only churches to thank for it. Back to you, Yerk. Heavy message to start the broadcast with, but that exactly is what is needed, Tom. Very, very much needed in these times. People need to hold, uh, need to know what to hold on. And um, we always advise the only thing to hold on is the AV 1611 King James Bible. And whenever you go into a discussion with anyone, uh, with anyone about uh, the four beasts of Daniel or anything else in the book of Daniel or the book of Revelation or even in any other book of the New Testament, just have your Bible ready. You on your own will not stand a chance discussing with any learned theologian who visited Jesuitical seminaries where they are taught casuistry and sophistry to turn the truth into falsehood. But when you have the Bible in your hand, you have the power of God in your hand. That's why Martin Luther, when he said for the, before the Edict of Worms, he said that if I'm not proven otherwise, if I'm not proven wrong by scripture or common sense, I cannot recant. By scripture. And the Roman Catholic Church never, ever even took it up to discuss him on the Bible because it's a dead born horse the Bible is the truth God's word is the truth and you cannot discuss the truth from a lying standpoint the Roman Catholic Church has no power over the Bible 
That is why the Roman Catholic Church teaches that her traditions are above Bible dogma. And when you confess that you are a Roman Catholic who adheres to the dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church, you at that moment not only give your brain at the door, but you also give your Bible away at the door. And you take over the traditions and dogmas of man at the same time. So whenever you want to discuss anyone on the subjects we just addressed here, make sure that you have a Bible in your hand because the Bible, the sure word of God, will never leave you in fail on discussions like that. And Romanists, Romans just don't discuss the Bible. They take out their opinions. They take out their philosophers. They take out their Socrates and Thomas Aquinas and I don't know, all these wonderful, quote unquote, wonderful doctors of the Roman Catholic Church, these teachers, which are doctors because their teaching is so eloquent, yeah, to the ears of one Roman, Roman who doesn't Catholic hear the word of, uh, of God, yeah? Roman, Roman Catholicism is more about Plato than it is about Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, I just said Socrates, but I meant Plato, Socrates, and, uh, you know, the, these, the <laughs> this Greek trinity there. <laughs> you have these three, these three guys, yeah. Yeah, um, the whole teaching of Thomas uh, from Aquinas was based on, uh, on Plato and Socrates. So Greek philosophy is the cornerstone of the Roman Catholic Church. Absolutely. And uh, that means that in the light of the Bible, they have no feet to stand on, no foot to stand on even. Nothing. So I suggest that we go into our video, Tom, and uh, see what Heinrich Bullinger, we are still at the reformers during reformational times, had to say about the Antichrist, because he said the Antichrist is the papacy. He says the little horn, that is the little horn that comes out of the ten horns, is the papacy. He says the man of sin, mentioned by Paul in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, is the papacy. He says Revelation chapter 13, the first beast, is pagan Rome. And he said Revelation chapter 13, the second beast, is papal Rome. And Revelation chapter 17, the harlot, is the Roman church. That is what Heinrich Bullinger said. Now you maybe know the name, but what do we know about Heinrich Bullinger? We we'll just open up Wikipedia and learn that he lived between 1504 um, and 1550. Yeah, that's his early life. <laughs> 1504 and 1575. Yeah, he was a Swiss reformer. He was the successor of Huldrych Zwingli. Um, he studied in Switzerland in the University of Cologne in Germany. Um, during, his uh, during this time, Bullinger was exposed works by the Latin and Greek church fathers Thomas Aquinas and the medieval scholastic Erasmus' Humanism and Luther. Bullinger later wrote in his diary that it, was uh, that it was reading Erasmus, Luther and Melanchthon that led him to his embrace of Lutheranism. In 1522, now a convinced follower of Martin Luther, Bullinger ceased receiving the Eucharist. Bravo to that and gave up his previous intention of entering the Carthusian order, that is a, a monastical order of the Roman Catholic Church, and earned his Master of Arts degree because of his Lutheran beliefs and actions, he was banned from obtaining a clerical position in the Roman Catholic Church. He had a ministry in Zurich in, from 1531 through 1575, and you can read about him more in this Wikipedia page. He died at Zurich and was followed as um, Anastasis uh, Antistus, uh, as Antistus by Zwingli's son-in-law, uh, Rudolf Gwalter. By the time of his death, he was one of the most well-known reformers in Europe. Okay, that says something about his Marian views um, that Tom said in the beginning. It is harder to get Romanism out of a man than man out of Romanism. And uh, also Martin Luther had uh, Marianical views that are based on Roman Catholicism. So I don't go into that. The link of uh, Heinrich Bullinger is in the 
uh, description box of this video. You can have a look at it and uh, go deeper into that from yourself. I also don't want to make this too long um, because this video is actually just to show you who these people are, that you have a, uh, a, an idea to start from who these people are. And um, therefore, it is not necessary for us to go into every little detail. But the next person here, William Tyndale, is of course a very important man. And I think that there's not one in front of the screen watching this video right now who has never heard the name of William Tyndale and, Tyndale and does not know who William Tyndale was. I just want to make a little um, summary of uh, who William Tyndale was. William Tyndale is first of all famous for the quote that he said to a Roman Catholic, uh, I think it even was a bishop that he said, that if God spent him many years, that he will make sure that the plow boy, uh, the boy who pulls the plow on the field, will know more of the Bible than your eminence, Mr. Bishop, in this regard. Um, Tyndale did um, travels through Europe. He uh, visited what we today call Belgium. Uh, he died even in Wilwode, which is some 25 kilometers from the place away where I live, uh, in the Duchy of Brabant, which is today Fla Flemish Brabant, in uh, Belgium, which was in that time, it was the Netherlands. You had the Netherlands northern part and the Netherlands southern part, and you had the 80-year war between uh, 1568 and 1648. Um, that in the end the Dutch uh, nation got split into North and South and in 1831 Belgium was uh, separated from the rest of Netherlands because the northern part of the Netherlands was uh, just uh, Protestant. They couldn't get a hold on it, not with war, not with anything else. So they just split it up and today I live in this uh, <laughs> southern part of Netherlands, <laughs> which is called Belgium, which is Roman Catholic, Jesuitical, to the core, and um, yeah, Dutch today, Netherlands, Netherlands also today, but he went, uh, he, 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 he went there, he also visited Hamburg, and he even had a shipwreck there, and it is probably even uh, quite sure that he met Martin Luther. Um, why did he do that? Well, he wanted to have his scripture and then translate that into English, and he is... Uh, uh, the author of the Tyndale Bible. And here we have a picture of his, um, uh, of his burning on the stake. Uh, he was gracefully strangled before he was burned, so he was not burned alive. They killed him before. And it is said that he cried out, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. And that was in 1536. I don't know why uh, this is here. Uh, this is a woodcut from Fox's Book of Martyrs from 1563. He did that in 1536, that's the year he died. And from the next year on, King Henry VIII of England um, obliged the churches to put out an English Bible, a Bible in the English language in their churches. So what Tyndale cried out just before he died, a year later came into fulfillment. And I think that's very interesting because I just heard a wonderful sermon speaking to somebody about um, John Huss, who you also know, who died in 1415 at the Council of Constance because he was betrayed. He was given a safe journey to and fro the, uh, the council, but they caught him there. They, uh, they condemned the papers. They being the papists. Yeah, yeah. Also, the also the the, the emperor in the time, um, yeah. because he also Thanks. gave him a, a, a paper of a free right. He didn't get that. Uh, the papists then condemned him to death and killed him. And it is said of Jan Hus that before he died, he said, "Today you uh, cook this goose," uh, because he was killed alive on the stake. And his name Hus in Czech. The language where he came from, he comes from che from from Czechia, uh, is the the name Hus means goose. So he said, "Today you cook this goose, but a hundred years from now a swan will pop up 
who you will not silence or catch. Now I learned that the uh, um, coat of arms of Saxony, where Martin Luther arose a hundred years later, uh, entails a swan. Now how about that of prophecy? First you have Tyndale, a year after his death, the Bible is put out in the English churches, and you have Jan Hus who says, a hundred years from now a swan will rise up whom you will not shut up and who you will not catch. He didn't get caught, he went to the Wartburg, translated the Bible, and since then the Bible was in German, which was a very important language in the time, in Europe, and many people were all of a sudden given the word of God in their own vulgar, <laughs> in their native language. Uh, just a wonderful part. And by the way, this is a video that I will uh, shortly mirror on my The Antichrist is the Papacy channel. It's very well, well worth watching. It is brought by uh, Jennings, uh, a, a man who Tom and I also read uh, a book from, I think, in the past. Anyway, this is about um, Tyndale, who died as a martyr for Christ in uh, 1536 in Brussels, yeah, in uh, in Vilvorde, it is called over here. And of course, he uh, translated the Bible into English. And he did that from the continent, uh, from, the, from the land over here. And then these pages of the Bible were sent over to England and uh, distributed there. The Tyndale Bible. And uh, it's William Tyndale who is the author of that. It's, uh, just a wonderful story. I don't know if you have anything to add on William Tyndale here, Tom? Oh, just that, that he was one of the great uh, martyrs of Jesus. Absolutely. Yeah. Just one of the multitude upon multitude upon multitudes that the papacy burned at the stake for telling the world the truth. The papacy is the Antichrist. Jesus is the Christ. The papacy is the Antichrist. And for that, they were burned at the stake. And Tyndale is a, a name worthy of our praise and our remembrance and our celebration of our faith. Tyndale, the great warrior for Christ. And he brought Protestant England, uh, the, the English scriptures, so they could read it in their own t native tongue and finally, finally get to read the word of God for themselves in their own language so that they could understand it. No more Latin for the English-speaking Englishman. And he did teach the plowboy in England to know more of the scriptures than the Roman Catholic bishop that tormented him. Praise God. And William Tyndale, one of the most memorable names in the history of the saints, whose blood still cries to God for justice from the ground. His blood mingled with righteous Abel, and God will vindicate both and take vengeance on their enemies. Back to you, York. Yeah, you can read what I told you in my own words. In 1535, Tyndale was arrested and jailed in the castle of Vilvorde, outside of Brussels, for over a year. In 1536, he was convicted of heresy and executed by strangulation, after which his body was burned at the stake. His dying prayer was that the King of England's eyes would be opened. This seemed to find its fulfillment just one year later with Henry's, that's Henry VIII's, authorization of the Matthew Bible, which was largely Tyndale's work with missing sections translated by John Rogers and Miles Coverday. So, you see, I first set it from my memory and here you can read it for yourself. The link will be provided in the description box of this video. A wonderful man, William Tyndale. Next, we come to George Joyce. On George Joyce, I didn't find any information. So we go to the next one. And that is also a very interesting one. As you can see when the video plays here, the next one is Nicholas Ridley. And actually we can, uh, the next two, uh, almost uh, speak at the same breath. Um, actually, the next three. The next three, yeah. Uh, this is Nicholas Ridley, Hugh Latimer, and Thomas Cranmer. Those are the next three very important reformers we speak about. 
Uh, the Antichrist is the papacy, abomination of desolation is the papacy, Revelation chapter 13, first beast is the papacy, Revelation 17, harlot is the papacy, Babylon ba papacy, beast is the papacy, Antichrist is the papacy, Antichrist is the papacy, little horn, man of sin, Revelation 17, harlot and Babylon. All is the papacy. That is what Nicholas Ridley, Hugh Latimer and Thomas Cranmer said. All three wonderful British uh, protesters. Um, we go into Nicholas Ridley first. He was born in 1500 and died, about, uh, died in 1555. He was an English Bishop of London, the only Bishop called Bishop of London and Westminster. He was burned at the stake as one of Oxford martyrs during the Marian persecution, speaking of Bloody Mary, for his teachings and his support of Lady Jane Grey. He is remembered with a commemoration in the calendar of saints in some parts of the Anglican Communion in the Church of England on 16th of October. A veneration of a man on a special day is something the Bible forbids, of course. This is still, again, uh, Roman Catholicism creeping into um, Protestantism. You can hear, see, you can read a, a very a long uh, article in Wikipedia on him, uh, even on this Hooper-Ridley debate, which is quite interesting to go into, which we don't have the time now. We leave this up to your own studies because it is very interesting for you to do your studies on your own, and we want to encourage you to study on your own. We want to give you links and help. We want to we want to give you help with the Bible. We want to help help you with. Uh, articles or, or, or websites as Wikipedia or whatever where you can look at or books where you can look at but we want to, you to engage in your own study don't just sit there and take everything up that we say or anybody else says with a spoon and be spoon fed that's not the idea now this is a table describing the burning of Bishop Ridley and Father Latimer, and that's why I said we can do these uh, together because the, let one, the next one is you, Latimer, and Thomas Cranmer is also in that uh, in same period, more or less. So um, here, Latimer and Ridley are burned, and um, isn't it here that they have this uh, famous saying um, that? Uh, you let him and Nicholas Ridley martyred by being burned at the stakes. When looking at these images, uh, da, 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 da. there was there was this one. Um, uh, wasn't it uh, those two, Tom, who 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 said this? Uh, Today you can uh, we light a candle that is never being extinguished, or something like that. Yeah, uh, there were some. Very, very encouraging words spoken by these people that were about to be burned at the stake. And uh, the testimony was that what they believed was the truth, and they weren't afraid to give their own lives a testimony for what they believed. And uh, one, of them, one of them had signed a recantation uh, that, uh, that the things that he had said about the papacy was wrong, and they tried to force him. Uh, you know, in order to save his life from burning at the stake, uh, made him recant. And uh, later he changed his mind and decided that what he what he had always preached was the truth. And uh, when it, when he went to the flames, he held out his right hand and said, let the flames consume this wicked right hand that signed my 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 uh, recantation. And uh, so he let the flames consume his hand that betrayed him by signing a recantation. These are these are. These are the kinds of people you don't see anymore. Mm. Well, there well, are no saints. There are no saints in the church today. The equivalent of these, who would stand at the, and burn at the stake, insisting, as I do today, that Jesus is the Christ and the papacy is the Antichrist. Who would burn to death at the stake with those words on their lips? while they went up in smoke. Jesus is the Christ. The papacy is the Antichrist. Now, I'm not looking for an opportunity to be burned at the stake, but you can better believe the Holy Spirit be on me and give me the power to tell the truth, even as the flames consume my body. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, the um, quote I was looking for is here, Tom. 
Bishop Latimer and Ridley, uh, it was said that they said on the, or, or that Latimer said to Ridley on the stake, be of good comfort, Master Ridley, play the man. We shall this day, by God's grace, light such a candle in England as I trust shall never be put out. Yeah, my memory isn't so good that I can remember a long quote like that. And the older I get, the harder it is to remember those wonderful quotes. That's why I looked it up, Tom. I can't remember it either. (laughs) The magnificent spiritual, the magnificent spiritual and courageous words and actions of the saints throughout history is, uh, well, it's beyond words. And listen, what should be uh, mandatory reading in all the churches is the same that was mandatory reading in all the churches before futurism got a hold. And that's Fox's Book of Martyrs. You ought to know what the saints of God believed and why they died as martyrs. Why were they killed? And who killed them? It was the popes and the kings of the earth over which he ruled. They killed the saints of Almighty God. Why? Because they said Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist. That's why the saints of Almighty God were martyred. And who martyred them? Acts and Monuments was the original title. It's now just colloquially called uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. But don't get the abridged version. Don't get the abridged version. Get the authorized version of Acts and Martyrs or Fox's Book of Martyrs and read it for yourself. Read it and weep. Go to your churches and show your pastor These are the saints of Almighty God, and here's why they were killed, and here's who killed them. Now, why is it that you preach from your pulpit that we ought to be that we ought to be followers of the Roman Catholic Pope? Why do you say that we ought to regard civil government as equivalent to God on this earth when they serve the Pope? Yes, I know all about Romans chapter 13. We're to obey the civil power. But what we've forgotten is the Bible stipulates that the civil power is supposed to be the servant of God, not the servant of the Pope. Okay? Every government in this world has abandoned Christ and God and now serves the man of sin in Rome. And they've done his bidding all throughout the Christian era. So you say... God commissioned man to love God and keep his commandments. He also commanded the governments of this world to, to uphold God's law, to, 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 uh, uh, to uh, punish evil and reward good. Well, what is evil and what is good? It's evil is violation of God's law and good is keeping God's law. But now the civil governments don't serve God anymore, just like man doesn't serve God anymore. Okay? The the governments of this world serve their master in Rome. And now they reward evil and punish good. That's what the civil powers do today. Never mind that they call themselves Christians. Look what they do. They reward evil and punish good. And they become a law unto themselves. They don't uphold God's law. They don't reward good and punish evil. They do what the Pope tells them to do. They uphold and maintain and enforce Roman Catholic canon law, which has replaced God's law. How can they reward good and punish evil if it's Roman Catholic canon law that they enforce? So Romans chapter 13 was God's design for the civil governments. But that's not the way civil governments have taken it. They serve the papacy. They uphold Roman Catholic canon law. They're not the servant of God. They were intended to be the servant of God, just like man was determined to be the servant of God. But man went astray, and so has the government of man. They serve man. They don't serve God. How? When will you ever hear that from the pulpit of any of your churches? And who can argue with me? Who can argue one word of what I just said? 
nobody. The governments of this world are just as wayward, just as abominable, just as lawless as man is. And what would you expect in a world that calls Roman Catholicism Christianity? Ask your pastor next Sunday. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, Tom, what you just said is too important as to just go over it and continue with this video. We are coming at the hour anyway and have to continue next time. But um, I want to say something very, very profound now uh, in regard to your um, statement on Romans chapter 13. Uh, first and for all, there's a wonderful video that you recorded years and years ago. I think it was on a show with Michael Adams in the time on Romans chapter 13 on nothing but the truth. Uh, that one is out on my YouTube channel. I will put the link to the description box of this video so that anybody who wants to can listen to that. Um, maybe Tom here and there feels a little bit that he can even do better than he did that many years ago. Then maybe in the future he will do another, uh, maybe even intenser study on Romans chapter 13. But that video is absolutely important to look at. And uh, there is one um, more uh, tip that I want to give you, one more advice that I want to give you. Um, some months ago from a brother in America uh, who is from Mexican descendants, I received a few audio, uh, audio clips um, on the teaching of um, Oliver Cromwell. And Oliver Cromwell more or less reigned in good old England in the time. And he reigned with what we would biblically call, biblically call an iron rod. Now, my point is the following. I have these three audios. I will take these audios, I will put them into a video format, and I will put those videos next on my the Antichrist is the, pa uh, the, the papacy is the Antichrist uh, YouTube channel. And then you can listen to those audios there and listen to that in regard when Tom, when you listen to Tom's teaching of Romans chapter 13. And I think that will give you uh, a very good understanding how a biblical government should look like when you see the government that. Oliver Cromwell stood for. I listened to these sermons, I think, two times. Uh, that's about three hours, uh, all three parts. So six hours at least, I, I listened to that. Sometimes he is difficult to understand, but it is a sermon where you really get pumped up. And when you are pumped up after that, you just open the Bible and you read Romans chapter 13 with the understanding of the teaching of Oliver Cromwell, who was um, Lord of the Nation or something it was called. And uh, uh, he, he refused to be a king of England. I think it was in the 17th century. Um, I'm not sure about that now. I don't want to say anything that is wrong. But anyway, um, check out the links in the description box of this video. Whenever I made the videos and uploaded them on my uh, The Antichrist is the Papacy channel, I will put them even later these links in here so that always you can come back to this video. Now, don't do this next week or so, no, not until the midst of April because I have time to do that and need time to do that. So bookmark this video, come back later, look in the description box of the video, find the links, look at Romans chapter 13 reading uh, and explanation by Tom and watch these three videos that I will put up on Oliver Cromwell on the Antichrist is the Papacy channel. And um, with that, I want to end this broadcast, which was much more interesting than I thought it would be in the beginning. And I want to give the closing remarks to my brother, Tom Fress. Yeah, well, I'm uh, blessed and privileged to be here and get to speak again to the listeners. And uh, I wish that if somebody could formulate 
a reasonable argument against anything we've said in this broadcast that you come out with it. You got any questions? Where is it that we're wrong in our assertions? What part of the history that we've shown you do you believe is incorrect? Is there any guile in this broadcast or anything that we've said that is not worth your trust? If there is, I'd like to know, what arguments would you have to the contrary to what we've been telling you on this broadcast? I want to know. And if you can't find an argument against it, then why don't you believe it? Thanks for listening. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by his death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman popes rule the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome's sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man. Salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit. A compromise Beware the ancient Papal lie With such a cloud Of witnesses Who by grace Died in their Lord Recall their Memory to say By the same faith We live today <laughs>